Hi, I'm Richard Weiss, former president of the Explorers Club, and I'd like to welcome you to the Explorers Club 50 lecture series. If you're new to the club and to the lecture series, I'd like to welcome you and tell you a little about ourselves and also about the Explorers Club 50. First of all, the Explorers Club was established in 1904. At that time, by a bunch of guys trying to get to the North and South Pole. And since that time, our members have covered just about every corner of the earth. In fact, when you walk into the lobby of our historic headquarters on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, there is a plaque on the wall that perhaps summarizes it best. Our members have been the first to step foot on the North Pole, first on the South Pole, first to stand upon Mount Everest, the highest point, the first to go to the lowest point in the ocean, and also our members were the first to go to the moon. Other notable explorers have been Theodore Roosevelt and Jane Goodall, and just about every notable explorer of the 21st century. Now about the Explorers Club 50. The slogan is 50 people who are changing the world that the world needs to know about. And I'll give you a little genesis of how that started. Uh, last uh, spring, during the beginning of the pandemic, one of our members said to me, you've got to check out this performance or this video called Earthrise by a young poet named Amanda Gorman. I watched it and it was about the Apollo 8 mission, which were our members. And I was blown away by how she described Earth, the environment and the fragility of our planet. We, we started a, a, sh a short correspondence and became pen pals. She became a member. But I also thought, how many other Amanda Gormans are out there in the world? In fact, when I got together with the chair of this program, Joe Rohde, who you'll be meeting in just a few minutes, you know, we got together and we said, how do we want to describe exploration in the future? And if we're truly a global exploration society, then our club has to represent the world as we see it. And not just in terms of how people look, but also how people describe the earth and the sky and just about everything in science. So how did we choose the EC50 honorees? 50 people who are changing the world that the world needs to know about. The first thing Joe Rohde said to me was that if you take a problem and you approach it with the same people, you are always gonna get the same type of result. So I, he immediately said, we wanted as diverse a judging panel, people who could look at the world through a different narrative and lens and be able to come together with some sort of conclusion. So he put together a group that was from all over the world. The next thing we had to do is have our membership give us people that they have met along the way that were doing incredible things that maybe weren't recognized for their work. We got about 450 nominations. And I have to tell you, they were pretty amazing. We could have gotten an EC200 out of it. We came out with our top 50 uh, honorees and the result was nothing less than spectacular. We have people covering all sectors of disciplines from space to paleontology, oceanography, we have Inuit, Native Americans, Americans, Sri Lankans, Indians, Africans, and just across the border. So this is the inaugural lecture series, and we'll have a few more that'll be rolling out over the week. But in the meantime, I want you to sit back and enjoy some good old fashioned storytelling. Well, to the Explorers Club uh, 50, we have four really interesting people we're going to talk to today. Our theme for the day is Ocean Stewards, and each of these individuals has a very, very different approach uh, to the world of the ocean and to the way in which they work uh, to preserve uh, and promote uh, conservation in this field. Um, and so without uh, further ado, let's get into it. We'll hear what they have to say about themselves, and then we will spend some time talking to them. Let's go. Hi, I'm Maggie Amsler, and I first want to say thank you to the Explorers Club for the honor of the EC50 Award, and to all those involved in bringing us together tonight. How fun to meet some of my EC50 members, and our great host, Joe Rohde, 
it's also really special to me to be considered an ocean steward. So I am a marine biologist currently affiliated with the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I have spent most of my career on, in, and around the Southern Ocean, the frigid waters encircling the continent of Antarctica. My first trip to Antarctica was shortly after graduating from college as a member of my advisor's research team studying a small shrimp-like organism called krill. Splitting those four months on the ice between uh, time at sea, collecting krill, and then coming back to a land-based research station, this one called Palmer Station, um, to live and do science. Now there are krill in all of the world's oceans, but the Antarctic krill is found only in the Southern Ocean. Its scientific name, Euphausia superba, the superba refers to the fact that it is the largest of any of the krill species and that it's found in astronomical abundances in the Southern Ocean. I like to think superba too because of all the superb adaptations that it exhibits to be so successful in the harsh environment of the Southern Ocean. Over the next decade, I would make another 11 trips to the ice uh, studying how that little crustacean could be so successful in light of predation by penguins and seals, and of course the really big gulpers, the humpback whales. Sometimes traveling down on powerful icebreakers like this, and especially during the winter time when a darkness falls over the Southern Ocean and a thick carpet of ice forms on the Southern Ocean, further complicating life for krill and for krill scientists. At that point, the, the only way to do science on krill is to put on a dry suit and go underneath the ice and collect and observe them for yourself. Years later, from the comfort of a submersible down at 400 meters, I was absolutely thrilled to be totally engulfed by a massive school of krill. School are so, krill are so vital to the vitality of the Southern Ocean. Now with colleagues and talented graduate students, I study how chemical ecology shapes and controls the many beautiful communities found in the shallow subtidal regions along the peninsula. It turns out that many of the interorganismal relationships that we observe in those communities are governed by noxious chemicals produced by the organisms themselves. While those compounds serve various functions for the organism, such as protection from predation, medical collaborators at the National Institutes of Health have revealed that some are effective in treating human ailments. Who would have thought that a sea squirt, basically a bag of water, but a close relative of ours, harbors a compound effective against human melanoma, or that a sponge has a compound that battles the staph bacteria that causes the MRSA biofilm. Now I've overlaid the scientific formulas on each of these organisms. So rather that than harvesting or farming these critters, chemists can produce synthetic versions. Yet that the potential for marine Antarctic critters or any organism on Earth harbors a possible benefit to humanity underscores the need to protect our oceans and their diverse inhabitants. A side project allowed me to investigate potentially invasive king crabs, again from the uh, submersible. There is a platform you talk to today. Our theme for the day is oceans. A side project.
was traveling down on powerful icebreakers like this, and especially during the winter time when a darkness falls over the Southern Ocean and a thick carpet of ice forms on the Southern Ocean, further complicating life for krill and for krill scientists. At that point, the, the only way to do science on krill is to put on a dry suit and go underneath the ice and collect and observe them for yourself. Years later, from the comfort of a submersible down at 400 meters, I was absolutely thrilled to be totally engulfed by a massive school of krill. School are so, krill are so vital to the vitality of the Southern Ocean. Now with colleagues and talented graduate students, I study how chemical ecology shapes and controls the many beautiful communities found in the shallow subtidal regions along the peninsula. It turns out that many of the interorganismal relationships that we observe in those communities are governed by noxious chemicals produced by the organisms themselves. While those compounds serve various functions for the organism, such as protection from predation, Medical collaborators at the National Institutes of Health have revealed that some are effective in treating human ailments. Who would have thought that a sea squirt, basically a bag of water, but a close relative of ours, harbors a compound effective against human melanoma? Or that a sponge has a compound that battles the staph bacteria that causes the MRSA biofilm? Now I've overlaid the scientific formulas on each of these organisms. So rather that than harvesting or farming these critters, chemists can produce synthetic versions. Yet that the potential for marine Antarctic critters or any organism on earth harbors a possible benefit to humanity underscores the need to protect our oceans and their diverse inhabitants. A side project allowed me to investigate potentially invasive king crabs. Again, from the uh, submersible, this time a thousand meters below the water, I was able to observe that these, these crabs are agile crushing predators with the potential to alter shallow water communities were they to range upward. Um, going a little shallower, I've also participated in scuba surveys at numerous points along the Antarctic Peninsula to catalog those diverse communities that are potentially vulnerable, not only to invasive crabs, but also the consequences of climate change. Many of those dive sites featured lush underwater gardens and forests. And yes, there are forests in Antarctica. You just have to go underwater to see them, but like forests on land and on sea anywhere on the planet, these too are imperiled by the consequences of climate change. Well, I would have been in Antarctica these last several months were it not for COVID. Using this elaborate experimental setup to investigate the predicted near future and far future uh, ocean acidification effects on marine communities. Uh, basically, we have miniature acidified southern oceans in each of these buckets. And our preliminary results indicate that there will be some winners and some losers in these in the in future ocean acidification scenarios. The losers include remarkably abundant but small crustaceans whose ability to molt and grow is impaired by ocean acidification. Yet these small crustaceans are incredibly vital to the health of the subtitle communities. And without them, there could be far ranging consequences. During my time on the ice, I enjoy sharing, sharing life and science through our UAB and Antarctica webpage and our YouTube subliteral video channel. When I'm in Alabama, I have opportunities to do hands-on research. A couple summers ago, colleagues and I put together a workshop for middle school science teachers, uh, uh, climate change from a penguin's perspective. And through those teachers reached some 6,000 
students. Imagine a league of 6,000 ocean stewards here in Northern Alabama alone. Well, I am out of time um, and I with that there's so much more of Antarctica and the Southern Ocean to share. I thank you so much for listening. Now, if there is, if time allows, I'd love to share a little video snip of Antarctica's undersea beauty with you. Thank you. Thank you.